director of the Center for Chinese Studies at UCLA. And it's our great pleasure to welcome you to today's event, which we hope will provide a forum for discussion, reflection, uh, and to really kind of unpack what's been unfolding in China over the last week or so in terms of the protests. Um, before we really start introducing our speakers and get into the program today, uh, I want to first introduce my colleague, Professor Alex Wong from UCLA Law School. He is my co-moderator. Um, Alex, do you want to say a few words of welcome? Yeah, uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, Welcome to everyone. It's great to see uh, so many people joining us today. Um, and a lot of credit for to, to Michael for uh, for spearheading this event and getting uh, this wonderful group together to to have this discussion. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Alex. So Alex and I will be going back and forth with the moderation, but we do have a couple program notes before we begin. Uh, one, uh, in order to pose questions, there is a and a box on the bottom of the screen. At any time during the event, feel free to post your questions there. And towards the end, we will have an open forum where we will be taking audience questions. Because of the sensitivity of the subject matter, um, please indicate if you would like your name to be read during the question or would like to remain anonymous. On the same note, if you do have any security concerns, we do encourage you to change your name uh, on your Zoom login name um, if you feel more comfortable doing that. We certainly encourage you to take those steps. Before we introduce our panelists, one, one important issue that we would be remiss not to address and talk about is the fact that here, as we are, uh, mostly based, I think, in this group in the United States, uh, talking about a protest movement in China. Several of us on this Zoom are from the University of California, where there is currently an important uh, labor movement unfolding right here before our eyes. And we thought it was important to read a statement of solidarity with the University of California TAs during this time. And so Alex and I are going to uh, begin by reading that statement. So as faculty, we want to acknowledge the central role that graduate students play in contributing to the educational mission of the University of California. We could not accomplish what we do as faculty without the support of our graduate students. And as inflation rises, rents increase, the modest stipends and wages that student workers receive is increasingly falling short when it comes to meeting these basic requirements for students to cover their expenses. This is especially the case in California, where the cost of living is considerably higher than other states in the US. As we embark on this discussion of a major protest movement breaking out on the other side of the world, it's not lost on us that there is an incredibly important protest movement taking place right here. We support our graduate students and their right to strike for better pay and benefits, and we also hope that both parties will be able to reach an equitable resolution soon. And there's been much discussion about what it means to cross the picket line during fraught moments like this. And we've heard from graduate students who've encouraged us to hold this event and others who suggested we postpone or cancel the event. Uh, we've taken these suggestions to heart and, and thought hard about it and explored ways to move uh, the event, event to, today to a different platform or a different time. Uh, however, due to the short timing and a variety of logistical challenges, we ultimately decided to proceed with today's event. Uh, it's a difficult balancing act to be sure to support our striking graduate students while at the same time ensuring undergraduates and other members of our community have a space for discussion, reflection, and analysis of an important event unfolding before our eyes that also speaks to issues of social justice. Thank you. Thank you. And and we're going to move on to introduce our speakers. And you'll notice if you're looking at the screen, the roster of speakers is different than what was originally advertised. And I think it's it's good to be transparent about the elephant in the room. This is related to the ongoing labor strikes. And there are some speakers. Uh, I think we're all navigating the strikes differently. And people have different levels of comfort in terms of participating in events like this and what it means to cross the picket line. I think for those of us present, we felt that uh, engagement was important uh, with this, with the events that are unfolding in China. Uh, at the same time, we do definitely support what's happening uh, in terms of the strike. And so, but it is, it is a challenging issue to navigate. And that is why you see a different roster of speakers uh, than what was originally advertised. So now we're going to tell you who we do have for you today on this incredible panel. And so I'll introduce the first speakers, and then I'll pass it over to Alex to introduce the others. <clears throat> 
First of all, we have Professor Victor Shi. He is the Ho Miao Lam Chair in China and Pacific Relations at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at uh, UC San Diego. He's an expert on the politics of China's fiscal and financial policies, as well as the elite politics in China. He's the first analyst to identify the risk of massive local government debt. And he's the author of two books, both published by Cambridge University Press entitled Factions and Finance in China, Elite Conflict and Inflation, and Coalitions of the Weak, Elite Politics in China, from Mao's Stratagem to the Rise of Xi. Um, and you can find a more detailed biography of Professor Xi online. And we also have Professor Jeffrey Wasserstrom. He is Chancellor and Professor of History at the University of California, Irvine. We have collaborated on numerous teaching events like this, so it's always good to have Jeffrey back with us. Um, and thank you for your continued support of the Center for Chinese Studies at UCLA. Uh, Jeff is the author of six books, including two that are very relevant to what is unfolding right now, uh, topics on popular po protest and unrest in China. Those books are Student Protests in 20th Century China, The View from Shanghai, and Vigil, uh, Hong Kong on the Brink, which was published in 2020. He is also a prominent public intellectual in our field. And you can see his writings in a variety of mainstream venues. And so thank you and welcome, Jeff. Uh, and our other uh, two speakers, uh, we have uh, Nason Mabubi, uh, who's a research scholar at, at uh, the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And he's also a lecturer in law at the, uh, the law school at Penn. Uh, Nason hosts a variety of uh, forum on, on Chinese law and politics, as well as on American law. So he's very prolific in that regard. There's a podcast at the Center for the Study of Contemporary China. Uh, a few of us in this group are involved in something called uh, uh, that's a Twitter spaces group discussion about law and politics. Uh, and and, and Nason is regularly holding uh, panels and events on American administrative law as well, bringing uh, in voices from from uh, from all over. Uh, and that is, uh, among other things, Nason's areas of ex expertise, administrative law in China. Uh, and so he'll have a lot to say. You know, a lot of the discussion about administrative law is kind of sort of about democratic mechanisms at the bureaucratic level. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what Nason has to say. Um, and then our, our next um, uh, speaker is uh, Katie Stallard, who's a senior editor for China and Global Affairs at the New Statesman and the author of, of a book called Dancing on Bones, How Past Wars Shaped the Present in Russia, China, and North Korea, to be published by Oxford University uh, Press. And she uh, uh, was um, previously based in Russia and China as a foreign, foreign correspondent for Sky News and has written for a variety of, of outlets on, um, on foreign affairs matters. So, so welcome to all of you and look forward to the discussion. Welcome. And as you can tell, our speakers represent a variety of different fields from history and politics, law, journalism, and we really felt that the dynamic nature of what's unfolding required this multidisciplinary approach. So we're hoping that everyone can come at this from different angles and really contribute to a dynamic discussion. And so with that, we're going to begin our dialogue. Alex and I will moderate and eventually we will open it up to the audience. But we want to begin with some backstory. On January 23rd, 2020, this is the first citywide lockdown uh, in Wuhan of the COVID era, um, probably in, of the modern era. We've never seen a city of approximately 10 million people locked down uh, like that. Since then, much of the world has experienced lockdowns, quarantines, stay-at-home orders. Um, but the first question is, how was the Wuhan lockdown unique? And how have China lockdowns been unique compared to what people experience uh, in other parts of the world, and how have these lockdowns evolved in China over the past three years? So we're trying to kind of uh, put out a broad uh, backstory or uh, to begin our discussion. I think, Victor, do you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. I guess I'll give uh, some very brief uh, background um, narrative, I guess, here. Um, so we have to remember that uh, initially, of course, China went through this pretty torturous process uh, as it came um, to terms with the nature of the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, cases began to emerge as early as maybe even late November, but certainly by early December, uh, there were cases of, uh, you know, um, flus of unknown origins uh, spreading around in Wuhan, uh, which the authorities at first denied, then acknowledged that there is this kind of mysterious flu, but then that it wasn't that transmissible. Um, 
And then in late December, early January, there was a central government team from China CDC that went to Wuhan. Uh, later on, they published uh, the first you know, article about COVID in, uh, in the International Journal, uh, where they said that they knew in early January that this, this flu had the potential of being a pandemic. Um, so the puzzle is why you know, they obviously told the central government this finding you know, as early as early January. Uh, Xi Jinping acknowledged in February that he had a meeting in early January where they discussed the serious nature of the COVID pandemic, but the public actually did not know about any of this. Um, you know, of course, the public in Wuhan, they were spreading uh, sort of so-called rumors of actually facts about how serious the pandemic was uh, in Wuhan. And then, you know, we have Li Wenliang getting arrested uh, or detained at least, um, and then later on dying tragically. Uh, but by, as you pointed out, by January 23rd, the central government decided to react. And it was like a switch had turned on. Um, so the entire Chinese government was mobilized. The entire city of Wuhan was locked down. And then a little bit later on, the entire province of Hubei was locked down. And this is something that I don't think any other country in the world uh, did which is to completely lock down a you know a large area of the country you know Wuhan is or Hubei I would say is probably the size of New York state or something or Pennsylvania uh, I don't know Nathan can I confirm this uh, so it is geographically a pretty large area and but no one could go into or out of the entire province except for approved pandemic fighting uh, personnel uh, the military was mobilized to provide medical aid to the city of Wuhan. Um, then uh, China has something that very few other countries have, which is uh, these neighborhood committees. Uh, and these are community level workers who are not really even paid a full salary, uh, but then they're asked to lock down at the neighborhood level, keep track of who goes into and out of a neighborhood making sure that people are only going out to buy essential goods. And in some cases, of course, later on, uh, entire neighborhoods or buildings were under total lockdown where people could not uh, go into or out. Uh, and then these uh, neighborhood committees were asked to deliver um, essential food to the residents. Um, so part of the frustration with COVID lockdown has been how stretched the resources of neighborhood committees uh, have been through these past uh, three years. Uh, the other thing that was done immediately after January 23rd was the construction of off-site quarantine facilities. Uh, they're called Fang Tang, you know, kind of a square storage space uh, in, in Chinese, where then in the end, millions of people who have had even sometimes indirect contact with COVID patients uh, have had to uh, go off-site, uh, forced to go off-site into these quarantine facilities for weeks uh, at a time. And that has been a source of frustration also. Yeah, I'm wondering if, if 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 you or anyone else can try to add some more detail. That that's very helpful in terms of the the background. Uh, but, but does anyone have a sense of the the day to day more on the day to day life under uh, lockdown? You know, one of the experience I've had, I've had at the law school is that we in the early days of COVID, those the last year we essentially didn't have Chinese students. This year they're back and many of them, we have quite a few from Shanghai, for example. So many of them just came out of the Shanghai lockdown and a, a number of them have been pretty open about being really uh, affected by, by that lockdown. And, and I know none of you have been there on the ground, I don't think, but what's your sense of what, what life is like just to give, you know, especially uh, in the States where it feels like we've maybe always, almost forgotten what it was like a year or two ago maybe give people a sense of what, what it seems to be like on the ground there. Can I briefly jump in on this, Alex? And yeah. um, I, I wanna say some other things too. So I just wanna say one quick word on your question and maybe pass that on to others and then yeah. add another supplemental thing to Victor's really great overview. Um, just in terms of the, the life in uh, Wuhan, I do wanna call attention to uh, my colleague, Yang Guobin's book, uh, The Wuhan Lockdown, which is a terrific resource and, um, is really built on the accounts of individuals who lived through it. Um, it's sort of a, almost like an exercise in cultural anthropology. So I, I think as far as a deeper account, I would I'd highly recommend that. Of course, there's 
um, a lot of uh, interesting work by so-called citizen journalists. Um, and obviously, Michael is very well familiar with that. Um, and maybe he will want to say a little bit more about that, about what it was actually like um, in those months in Wuhan. But the one thing that I wanted to add, sort of supplemental to Victor's great um, overview, is the story in December in Wuhan, I think, does need to call attention to the fact that there were these political meetings in Wuhan for uh, Wuhan authorities and Hubei province authorities, political meetings that do seem to have played a role in um, the Wuhan political authorities not wanting uh, the population to be too aware of slash afraid of the virus. You know, I think there's so much uh, drama around our discussion of the origins of the virus. Um, and I think a lot of unhelpful discourse about whether it was from the wet market or the lab leak. I think by now we've reached a point where no one plausibly believes that certainly that the virus was weaponized in some kind of a facility. Um, and it does seem like the scientific evidence is tilting more towards what was always understood to be some kind of a natural occurrence out of the wet market. But putting all of that drama aside, I think it has in some ways taken our attention away from the fact that political dynamics in Wuhan did prevent um, the reporting system from working properly, the reporting system that had been set in motion um, because of the SARS crisis back in 2003. And there was supposed to be a way that the initial accounts of what this new virus were that doctors like Li Wenliang were noticing was supposed to get reported through the Chinese Center for Disease Control apparatus all the way to the top very quickly. It turns out that the head of the Chinese CDC, Dr. George Gao, um, he only found out about it because he was scrolling his WeChat, you know, at the end of December and saw some sort of things that he thought, wait, there must be something going on here. And that's what set in motion the central uh, response. Um, and I say that not because I particularly want to pick on the Wuhan officials. Obviously, you know, this was a challenging thing for any officials in any place to, to uncover. But there was a political story to why there was a somewhat delayed response, why the center did not get involved more quickly. Um, and I think that not only is important on its own terms, but because there was that story that became well known, not only outside of China, but within China, I think the fear of the Chinese population about the virus um, was even greater than it might have been otherwise, which I think is a really important point for setting up our later discussion of how overall the Chinese population has responded to this virus. The fact that it was a very clear, I would even say scandal in that early period that reminded many Chinese people of the way in which Chinese authorities had not told the truth about prior issues, whether it's the milk melamine scandal or you know, what happened in Sichuan with the earthquake, it just generated even more of a concern from the Chinese population. So when the central government finally did really take account of what was going on, the response had to take into account that a lot of people in the country were really upset about the failings in Wuhan in the early days in December. Can I jump in on that briefly too, um, just Please. to add to what to what Nathan said? I wasn't um, based in China as a journalist um, during during this pandemic, but I think we often miss how much of the information we are relying on as journalists, particularly covering China from abroad, is coming from very brave Chinese citizen journalists, many of whom you know did so at considerable risk and have subsequently been detained. Um, you know some of whom are, are, are still in custody. So I think one thing to really center in our discussion of this is I think we there can be a tendency to sort of put, you know, the Chinese people or the Chinese response to this as a, as a sort of abstract um, object. Actually, you know, the real, the, the lived experience of, of, of looking at this and the people who really did put themselves in, in, in you know, both physical and political harm's way to cover it. Um, was was our Chinese colleagues. So we are, you know, we are incredibly, particularly as so many of us are now outside China, and as it has become so difficult to report from inside China ourselves, you know, we are really dependent on that as a source of information. If I can jump in for a general point drawing on this that I think can can reappear throughout the discussion, 
and actually in an interesting way relates back even to the strike, the local uh, issue at UC, is we've been talking a lot um, about living through a global pandemic and living through a global moment. There's a lot of talk about the interconnectedness of the world. And I think we've seen reminders in the Chinese uh, protests recently of that interconnection, of the flow of um, ideas and images and information back and forth. But to me, um, COVID has also powerfully underscored that to play on Bruno Latour's line, we've never been modern, we've never been global, and we still aren't global. The way in which things were understood, sometimes terms that are used to refer to different places actually obscure things. We talk about lockdowns and we talk about protests against lockdowns in places like the United States that in comparative terms never had a lockdown in any shape or form like the Wuhan one. It was just radically different. And actually there was a period of time, it's, it's not just that nations are different, but locales are different. One of the things that really affected people in Shanghai during the, the lockdown this year was that they hadn't gone through something quite like that and had imagined it as the kind of thing that happened in places like Wuhan. And um, I think Nason's point is, is absolutely important that the memory of or the go-to place of SARS and other scandals within China shaped the feeling about this. And actually, one of the reasons why different responses in different parts of East Asia were different had to do with whether SARS had been at the front of people's minds. So when we think about why Taiwan responded very quickly as this is something that could affect us and went into very stringent measures. It had something to do with proximity and memory. A lot of times this is that people process things through, uh, as the historian, I'll say, whatever a current crisis goes through, people reach for parts of the past uh, to make sense of it. When 9-11 happened here, people reached to Pearl Harbor, even though it was so radically different. And that seemed very strange to people in other parts of the world who thought there are much more sensible kinds of analogies. Uh, during the early stage of COVID and responses to it, there was discussion in England, in the British media of the Blitz. There was discussion in America, bizarrely, of 9-11. There was discussion in China of things like SARS, but also one of the things that I heard, at least anecdotally, and you would know better than me, Michael, having uh, translated Fang Fang, there was talk that people in Wuhan were binge watching Chernobyl, uh, the television show, because they thought that spoke to them. Whereas I would read things in the American uh, and European press saying, everyone's reading to Cameron. Everyone's reading these books about the play. Everyone's reading Camus. And you know, people were actually processing it in different ways. In Japan, there was some sense of a deja vu of Fukushima because people thought about the things they'd gone through and that shaped differently um, how they lived through that. In the same way that when we talk, so we are we have access to global news, but we often focus on certain things about our own past, certain things that we relate to about it. And here too, I mean, I'm glad we brought up the strike at the University of California, but I'm about to be a visitor in the UK at a university in the spring. If you read the newspapers in the UK, they're talking about the biggest strike in the history of higher education in the UK is going on right now. That's not something that I'm hearing much discussion of in the United States in the same way probably people tuning in from the UK now are not hearing about the largest strike by graduate students um, in the United States. So this is just a reminder that we live in very interconnected times, um, but we also live in very siloed times and not just siloed by political polarization, though that's part of it, but also by just our, our interest in, in what's local. Thanks. I'm so sorry, could I just add one thing to Jeff's really deep and I think important comment? I just can't help but remember what it was like to be a China scholar, January, February, March of 2020, where anyone in our field, um, and certainly, um, you know, Chinese people in the US were not focused on China, but had family back home, were, were very aware of what was going on in China. But I certainly had the experience of trying to tell my friends and family in the US about what was going on 
and no one took it seriously. So until literally, I think it was March 11th or March 20th, everyone thought that I was saying something that was just well beyond their their uh, frame of uh, concern. And, and I think when we think about the different responses to the pandemic in the years after that, those three months are really important because there was a certain perspective on the pandemic that I think crystallized in China and then another perspective that crystallized certainly in the US. And, and that I think is the origins of a lot of the divergence that we see in responses in the years after that. Thank you everyone for those contributions. Um, I wanna kind of try to unpack a little bit about the zero COVID policy, which is so central to what people are railing against right now, at least over the last week. And I was wondering if we could talk a little about the origin and rationale behind China's zero COVID policy. I don't know if any other nations in the world have a zero COVID policy or anything even close to what China has enacted. And I think there's a lot of different rationale. I mean, some people look at it as a political act. Others look at it as a very practical act based on one, the low efficacy of Sinovac and Chinese vaccines, and also the high density of population. And if they don't do the lockdowns, the death toll might what what that, that it could 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 be catastrophic and so that's a very tricky balancing act but i was wondering if we could kind of unpack what's behind the policy and secondly how the public's response to zero covid policy has evolved over the last three years because we've seen moments of gratitude and celebration and more recently moments of anger and unrest and uh, i was wondering who would like to tackle some of that Uh, I guess I'll jump in very quickly. Um, so I'd say through 2020, China's approach of very draconian lockdown, offsite quarantine uh, was more or less fully justifiable, medically speaking, because this was when uh, no one had a vaccine. And also the uh, rate of uh, serious illness, the rate of mortality uh, was pretty high, you know, in the original uh versions of covid uh and you know the reason why other other countries didn't do that well actually a few countries did do it. so vietnam had it uh, japan more or less at least quarantined itself from the outside world but vietnam you know completely also uh had what china uh had um you know it's just most countries cannot do it you know they just don't have the kind of grassroots enforcement capacity the way that china has still today uh, and it was a success, you know, so China's approach to fighting of uh, controlling COVID was uh, an astonishing success, actually, at a, at a time when COVID was spreading like wildfire in the West and, you know, very high rates of infection, serious illness, uh, intensive care units being overwhelmed, people, you know, a million people dying in the U.S., um, so for for the rest of the world, they really had no choice but to pursue this other route of trying to develop vaccines as quickly as possible and then vaccinate people, because most countries simply did not have China's capacity to lock down. Um, I, I think the the where things began to become a bit more problematic is going into 2021, when uh, a lot of the Western vaccines uh, began to roll out. Uh, China also developed its own vaccine, but initially, at least, the efficacy, you know, rate was not nearly as high as some of the Western vaccines. Uh, then, but China then continued to pursue this uh, route of using. Well, I mean, one thing we didn't talk about yet is using very sophisticated algorithms to track uh, who not only who were infected, but also close contacts and secondary contacts. Uh, with those who are actually in, infected and then using that data as a means to determine who would have to go through offsite uh, quarantine or in-home uh, quarantine uh, later on. Um, so China continued down this route of using quarantines and lockdown as a way to control COVID, whereas the rest of the world just completely out of just, you know, uh, it's an inability to do what China has done. Uh, pursue this way of vaccination. Uh, so that's where we we really saw divergence going into 2022. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Oh, Jeff, you're uh, muted. Yeah. 
I'll just add, um, this is another case where I think um, putting China into a global context is valuable that um, while there was no place else that did exactly the zero COVID thing, there were places that had fairly stringent um, entry and, and exit rules. There were, Australia had, uh, there were ways in which you could think if you were um, living through this within China, you could think that what China was doing was related to what some other uh, places that you might think of as, as admirable to some degree, or at least part of your same common world, not, not thinking about North Korea, which would seem a kind of negative thing, but it, but there was an awareness that in Taiwan there were um, there were there was a lot of control of who went in and out in Australia. So there's not just been how the change of efic efficacy has been, but there's an increasing sense of being an outlier of being separate from it, and that's part of why I think um, the anger now has something to do with an awareness of other parts of the world where people were are moving around much more much more easily again. What what is your all sense of when uh, celebration turned to anger? You know, because if you think back to twenty twenty, right, like April May at that point, it was you know sort of chaos in the United States, and a lot of my contacts in China were reporting fair you know fair amounts of normalcy back then. And I don't know what what are you in your all you know how you're perceiving it. When when's your sense of when it turned? And Alex, I just want to really reinforce that analogy, the uh, comparison to the U.S. I mean, to my, to me, two factors that played a huge role in the way that the policy developed and it sort of solidified. One, going back to what I was saying earlier, just it's really important to remember, you know, as we're looking now at these protests against the Chinese government for the COVID policy, it's really important to remember how upset and angry Chinese people were back in January, February, about what they perceived as the failings of the government to protect them. So I think that is really a deep thing that drove government policy. But then going from March onwards, seeing the incredibly chaotic, ineffectual response in the United States helped to solidify that sense as well. And so I think I've seen there's been um, some public opinion polling done around April, May 2020 the Chinese population very much, and of course we can put all the caveats about public opinion polling in, in China, but I think it's also feels that it's supported by all of our sense of conversations with Chinese colleagues, that there was huge support for the policy because one, it was against the backdrop of the fear of that early period. And then two, um, looking at the incredibly chaotic response in the US. But then your question of when it begins to turn, I think is a, is a really interesting one. Um, I don't think even to this day, and I know we'll get into this later, that it's fully turned. Um, my sense is that there's still a substantial Chinese population that is fearful of the virus and does not want opening up. And I hope we can delve into that later. But to the extent that there are people who have started to feel like maybe these policies are too draconian and maybe other parts of the world are starting to do it better, I think that really kind of starts becoming more clear around April, around the time of the Shanghai lockdown. Maybe other people started seeing it earlier, but that's the first time that I started to notice that there was a real feeling that was meaningful within China that maybe this was not the best way and it did not compare as favorably to certainly the US example, which again, is not the only country in the world, but is the country that I think is oftentimes most used as a reference point for certainly the Chinese government, but maybe Chinese people as well. So you think the turn is really happening this year, the earlier this I year? I think so, but I'd be curious to hear what others think too. Can I just add to that, which is I think another major factor was how quickly this was politicized, both in China and here in the US. In China, we saw very explicitly the government link its response to its political system and the zero COVID policy was, you know, she was handing out medals. You know, this is evidence of what China can do, which the US, which is, you know, dysfunctional, decadent, self-involved, can't. And we saw the mirror image to that here in the United States. You know, I, I think an interesting thought exercise would be whether this would be different with a different political administration here, but with the administration that we had at the time and these very early efforts to you know, 
call it the China virus, to, to use these, you know, terribly racist terms to, to, to talk about what was happening and to, and to place the pandemic within the broader contest with China. I think we really saw a political contest happen in parallel with individual countries' uh, attempts to, to manage the pandemic. And just to support what Nason was saying, I think in my own reporting where I started to really hear much more concern was around the start of this year and particularly the run into the Winter Olympics, um, by which time we already had the terrible stories of, you know, the, the, the woman who couldn't get get treatment and who had a, the, the miscarriage on, on the way to the hospital. So th I think those stories were really starting to come to the fore around the start of this year, um, but we heard much, much less of that beforehand. Yeah, I think uh, there could be a well, no, kind of a transnational dimension to this also um which is i i see a huge difference among my chinese students at least uh but you know i have quite a number of them uh from last fall to this fall so last fall uh people were still very weary uh well but you know including <laughs> uh not just students from china but you know all students you know uh, a lot of masking uh, you know, because back then it was also the Delta wave uh, where the the incidence of serious illness is higher. Um, but then uh, basically with very high vaccination rates uh, with the transition to Omicron uh, this year, especially spring and summer of this year, I think even many of my Chinese students just decided that, hey, you know, it's not a big deal anymore. And surely they must be WeChatting their friends in China. They're like, hey, you know, in the US, I'm studying overseas. I'm going to Costco. I'm going to, that's not the only place they go to, but that's the only place they tell me they go to, um, you know, bars and restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that that is having an uh, effect. And this also explains why even students in elite universities like PKU, Tsinghua University, they're the most, uh, they're the students with the most contacts with overseas students. Um, they're probably learning how, you know, the rest of the world is, is normalizing. And, you know, for, for people who haven't seen it, um, the Nanfu Wang documentary, In the Same Breath, is a really great coverage of 2020. I mean, it's, it feels like we've all been in this time vortex, right? 2020 feels like ages ago, but you know, a part of the dynamic on her portrayal of the China, she she very well portrays the chaos in the United States. But on the China side, it, it's a story of how, you know, despite many people feeling confident in the 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 lockdown, that there's a lot going on on the, the surface that we're not aware aware of, of of people being treated unjustly and that sort of thing. So that backdrop's interesting as we move more towards the present, in the fact that you know, despite that, people are really. Um, being coming disgruntled for a variety of, of reasons. Uh, Michael, should we kind of shift forward in time a little bit to this this year, maybe it's sure. about time? Yeah. I mean, so just before we actually get into the kind of protests going on, you know, it's worth just flagging that just a month ago, we had the 20th National Party Congress, um, and you know, major political event in, in the Chinese political scene. Uh, it was a moment that was preceded by many months of anticipation, and among other things, you know, she uh, famously basically locks down his. Uh, I shouldn't use the term lockdown, but sort of pins down his his unprecedented uh, third term. Um, but there were also moments of controversy that peak out, right? Famously, the Sitong Bridge protest in near Renmin University in in Beijing. Um, there's question about how that has influenced what's going on now. Um, and then also this issue of Hu Jintao being es escorted out of the, the main meeting and what did that mean? So is there anything to understand, to think about the, the that political period, you know, that period political dynamic, how it, it is relevant for thinking about the protests going on right now? Sure. I think I think the a couple of things stand out to me. The first is I think China uh, China specialists in general really owe it to the world to say we were surprised, we were shocked by some of this. Even though when you track it back, you can say, well, of course, uh, there were things that made it logical. Nobody was expecting in uh, Beijing with ramped up surveillance techniques right before the party congress, that there would be any kind of 
protest like that, the bridge. Not We knew that people were discontented and there might be people who'd wanna do that, but it really punctured a sort of image of the kind of totalistic um, control of even the highest of the surveillance state thing. So that was, I think that was one thing. There was also a lot of talk about how Xi Jinping was likely to stack um, the standing committee, but nobody that I know was saying every single member of it would be somebody who um, was tied to him. So that was also a surprise. Um, there was a notion that there would tend to be at least some kind of deference to former leaders who were in the room and that wasn't shown to Hu Jintao, whatever else uh, was happening there. One specific thing I think related to the protest, though it's hard to um, it's hard to know for sure about this, is that one center of the protest was Shanghai. There was a lot of anger in Shanghai over the lockdown. The person most responsible for the Shanghai lockdown could, in one way of dealing with this within the Chinese political system, is you blame local officials for misapplying uh, policy that you're then defending as, as being correct. One way to deal with zero COVID would have been to say, the policy is absolutely correct, but some of the lockdowns have been overly stringent. But instead, when um, when the head of uh, Shanghai was elevated to the standing committee, you could see that if somebody were somewhat, that would be one place where quotidian anger at the lockdown would fuse with discontent about Xi. And I would also mention another thing about recent, this is a, a different event than those, but it's part of say the same story of the fall that, that is not a story of, of protest, is right before the protests, you went from seeing images of Xi Jinping being the one leader in a Central Asian setting where he was still wearing a mask in one setting to a picture of Xi Jinping, images of Xi Jinping and Peng Li Yuan getting off planes in Bali and in Thailand maskless. And so at the same time, I think it's great to combine these levels. So Victor's comment about people, so you're getting on your WeChat things about students, you know, who are going to Costco and going to bars, and then you're seeing uh, Xi Jinping um, in exotic locations uh, traveling. And you're thinking, you know, these are the things that I would like to be doing and I'm not doing. And one of the through lines in uh, Chinese protests to put a line on this, and I think we need to stress that there have been protests going on in China continually since the time of Tiananmen. These pro we, we can get to what makes these distinctive, but there have been multiple, multiple protests around the country on many, on about many grievances. But one of the grievances that one of the things that connects worker protests, um, villager protests, others, uh, and urban protests is something that is a sense of unfairness, a sense that in this kind of setting where everybody's supposed to have equal opportunities of some sense or some kinds of chances, or there's at least some commitment to um, fairness, that there's gross unfairness. And I think that's, you know, labor protests are very different, land expropriation, but a kind of disgust with what feels like um, it, official corruption is one of those manifestations of unfairness, but other ways they differential application of, um, of controls is another, but that's a kind of through line that you then start to see showing up in these seemingly unrelated kind of, of contexts. Yeah, and as Jeff mentioned, you know, it's not just seeing uh, Xi Jinping and Peng Liu and traveling internationally, but the World Cup has just been playing out and Chinese, there's a lot of soccer fans turning on their TV and seeing tens of thousands of people crowded into an arena, maskless, and thinking, how come we're still locked down, you know, and I, I, I think that kind of context is also important. Does anyone else want to comment on uh, Alex's question about the impact of- I was going to add one thing that, as I said, I'm thinking that I should- put a caveat that is, I think, an important caveat, but also maybe not so um, uh, damaging because of the nature of the protest. But the caveat has to do, there was a very interesting thread on Twitter today about how many of us who are uh, China watchers tend to engage with elite sectors of Chinese society. And um, we, we don't know as much about sort of uh, working class uh, concerns in China. Um, and, and the reason I, I say that is because the two things about the Party Congress, which I think are relevant, uh, 
were probably things that landed especially sharply with elite audiences. But then the reason I think that maybe it's not so damaging of an admission here is because there is a way of telling the story about these protests that centers on students um, who are obviously part of that elite. Um, so to the extent, and I know we're going to get into this deeper, but to the extent that the current protests are student driven or that there's a lot of a student dimension to it, I'm fairly confident that students would have picked up on these two aspects of the party Congress that I'm about to mention. So the first is that the nature of Xi Jinping's um, all encompassing power became excruciatingly clear. I think there was a lot of um, maybe misguided hopefulness that the new leadership team announced at the end of the party Congress would include some figures that at least in the popular or elite imagination were not fully on board with the Xi Jinping agenda. You know, whether it's uh, Li Keqiang himself or someone else like Wang Yong or Hu Chunhua, who is again understood to be part of that wing. Um, there was this expectation that obviously when we saw the leadership lineup come out and it was understood to be all people who are deeply loyal to Xi Jinping without any representation. And in fact, you know, people like Hu Chuanhua is not even on the Politburo, uh, not even on that group. It did solidify this notion that whatever direction China was seemed to be going in in recent years of centralizing authority in Xi Jinping was even going further. So I think um, that was the first punch. Um, and then the second punch is one of an expectation that was not met. I think, especially in elite circles, there was this sense that after the party Congress, there would be an immediate loosening up. Everyone kept saying, wait till after the party Congress, then you'll see that some of these things that people at that point were starting to feel um, were quite burdensome, they would loosen up. And then that didn't seem to happen either. So it was, you know, this one two punch of, wow, this leadership is even more centralized and authoritarian um, than we thought it might be. And wow, they're not loosening up the way that we thought it might be. I think conceptually, those two things played a big role in at least elite opinions about, um, about the sort of COVID policies that then translate to the way that the students um, have been expressing themselves in recent days. Thank you, Nason. And, uh, you know, I'll add even a third, which is they were all men uh, and there wasn't a single woman on the on the new roster. And actually, as the protest movement has unfolded, women have taken a really core leadership role. And I don't think that's necessarily a coincidence that um, China has come a long way since the era of Mao and women's place in society has transformed radically. But that's not reflected in the political reality of what we saw at the party Congress. Can I add to Nason's excellent point on, I think it, I've come to think of it as the lack of an end in sight that I think, you know, a lot of us who, who are watching this were expecting there will be some sort of shift, both both inside China and outside that, you know, just wait until after the Congress. It's everything's closing down now, everything's under really tight control. But once, you know, he, once he gets his lineup, once everything's assured, then we're going to see some real changes. So when he, you know, we, we saw the lineup, we saw who the individuals were, and then there was no real effort to change. I can see how, you know, if you've been living with this for almost three years at this point, how this would be the point at which you would think when and how does this come to an end? Um, just to, to follow up to Jeff's point too, I think that I was based in Beijing during the 19th Party Congress. And I think it is important to be clear and to be extremely humble about how much of this that we as, as, as journalists and as analysts get wrong all the time. So having experienced that Congress, the idea that it would be possible to stage this you know, very effective, highly visible protest in Beijing two days, three days before the opening of the Congress um, was extraordinarily surprising. And I think two correctives that, that we've seen kind of play out through the course of the pandemic is sort of understanding the limits of what I think can be presented, especially from afar, as this very effective, um, all-consuming um, source of the Communist Party's control. And actually, you know, we, we I think looking at two things which are continually fascinating to me are looking at the inability to get particularly older people vaccinated, 
And then despite the, you know, we, we, we've done a lot of reporting on the censor censorship apparatus, but despite how quickly the, you know, that, that protest on the bridge was shut down very quickly in real life, references it, to it were censored very quickly online, but yet it had still clearly been shared and was, and continued to be shared. Um, I, I think we, we sort of, we need to understand um, how, you know, how little or how much we have got wrong in, in, in our analysis of China. And I guess a lot of the time, how simplistic um, the, the vision that we're, that is being presented of, of China is. So, you know, I, this is a very long way to say, you know, a lot of us have got, have got a lot wrong over the course um, of, of covering this pandemic. Thank you. So maybe we should talk about the fire that uh, broke out in Urumqi in Xinjiang on November 24th. Uh, this was an incident that led to the death of 10 people. Uh, that's what's the public number that's been reported and at least nine uh, injuries. The story that we're getting is that firefighters were not able to properly gain access to the building due to COVID barriers. Uh, there were also barriers around the building that may have prevented people from escaping. And that became the kind of spark that lit these protests because, you know, at the, at the center of it, the COVID policies are supposed to help people to protect them. And here is an incident where those very policies are bringing harm to people. And we started to see protests break out in cities all around China. Uh, we also witnessed these remarkable set of protests in Shanghai on Urumuchi Road, and you saw the removal of the street sign uh, and a subsequent flurry of memes and the way it kind of went viral and people started printing out the sign of Urumuchi Road and posting it all over the world to show you can't erase it. And it was a, a moment of great creativity among Chinese netizens in terms of how they take censored terms and are able to spread them and uh, use coded language to, to advance what they're fighting for. I'm also curious though uh, for this group is we all know that since uh, right around the period of COVID there was also a hotbed of controversy surrounding Xinjiang. Remember the whole Xinjiang cotton controversy and it even Del went in the popular culture with the film Mulan and uh, it, it got very deep. And so there's a whole backstory of controversy between Xinjiang, human rights issues, and also East and West and how the Western media has portrayed issues related to human rights in Xinjiang versus how the Chinese media has address those incidents. My question is, is there another story here in terms of the way in which this street name has be went viral and become ubiquitous? And uh, this the, is, is there something else that's playing out kind of in coded language in terms of what people are trying to express and say about uh, Xinjiang, China, the West, and vis-a-vis -vis what, what's happening with the COVID protests? I'm just curious what your readings are about that context. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll start this kind of discussion and maybe it's a, a bit roundabout, but I think that a crucial thing in the lead up to the, the protests was there were a variety of incidents in which people were losing their lives due to a policy that was supposed to save lives or their lives were being threatened um, through this. Uh, the bus crash in, um, in Guizhou is a really good example of that. Um, that led to a lot of uh, discussion online. It also happened at a, I mean, it happened on September 18th, which is uh, a national humiliation day related to an invasion of by Japan. And some people said, this is a real national humiliation. A government that came to power with the idea of protecting the lives of people is now uh, harming them. But all sorts of things were going on online. And again, thinking about how this isn't new to COVID, it reminded me of incidents where an abuse of a, um, um, of a young woman by um, a bullying, uh, predacious Chinese official, an incident would come out and it would go viral online. Um, and what, what, what drove it was people, I think, thinking that could have been a member of my family. That could have happened to somebody like like me, but it would often be just online. What was new in this case was that the online anger then also became in-person anger and on the streets anger. 
And I think, I mean, I think Katie was nicely sort of saying, thinking of journalists that we get some things wrong as we're covering this. But I think it's it's sometimes academics or specialists, somebody say, well, if only they'd listen more to scholars. But I'm just going to say scholars, I've been studying nothing but um, protests for much of my career. And the fact that this wasn't just another case of online outrage, but led to the on the street outrage in multiple places surprised me. I don't think there was a way in which uh, maybe if you have more access to information, specialists and information uh, can specialists can predict these things, but often not. Social movement, social action are fundamentally, in some ways, intrinsically. Uh, there's so many contingent decisions that um, they are, in a sense, unpredictable. But I think the question is now with that fire that did it it probably had that threshold of people found it very relatable. The people in that um, in that building could have been their family members, people they know. And that's actually what some of the discourse online was. There was a blurring of this, of whether it was, I mean, it potentially could, uh, could allow for much more solidarity of feeling toward Uyghurs, and more, and there have been some calls among protests to say, let's also talk about the other things that are going on that are so disturbing in Xinjiang. Let's talk about the forced indoctrination camps. Let's talk about those. But I think, and, and I think why it might be a wedge that could lead that is there's a way that the official discussions of the camps tends to focus on the discourse of the war on terror, tends to focus on the discourse of these are people who are potentially dangerous. When there are children who are trapped in a burning building, that relatability of saying that could be somebody like, like me is much stronger for, say, a Han Chinese who hasn't thought too much about the situation in Xinjiang than when they see pictures of a lot of men in their 20s and 30s and 40s or whatever that don't seem that different from things they've been seeing in discussions of the war on terror in other places. So I think it's it's an open question now of what that, you know, the Irumuchi Road, I mean, there was that, there was also the fact it was Shanghai where there had been a big burst of the online protests. It's also a fact there are, Nason's right, that students are playing a role in this. It's a place with uh, elite universities other than Beijing. A lot of these things are are bundled together. We may not be able to separate them, but I think that that sense of does it feel like it could be that could be me that this is happening to? There are certain things that China is a very diverse place. There are times when people don't think it could be just like me. Initially with Wuhan, people outside of Wuhan thought this is a Wuhan problem. There was pejorative things said about the Wuhan about people in Wuhan initially. Um, that wasn't as strong as the the anti-Chinese racism in some other parts of the world, but had a kind of um, prejudicial side to it. So this is all kind of in flux. It's the question is, are people starting to think of having more, being more in the same position as people in parts of the country they didn't care about? I've definitely seen this in discussions with um, Hong Kong, um, Hong Kongers I've I've talked to. There's a steady discourse among Hong Kongers now is that why that we should be paying more attention to, we should have paid more attention to what was happening in places like Tibet under stringent control and Xinjiang, because now we're realizing that those kinds of things could be affecting us. And that that is a there's always a push and pull between do you relate to the thing someplace else or not? Um, there's been some discussion now of flows between ideas about the repression in Hong Kong now and the repression on the mainland, when people are saying, wait, the seizing of cell phones we, of protesters, we've seen that before. That was happening in Hong Kong. It wasn't happening in Shanghai. So there's all kinds of ways in which this is a moment of, of things being in flux. And I think that's something the, the government is, is worried about and, sh and needs to be worried about because they've done a good job of segmenting uh, the Chinese population until now. The one other thing I would be remiss not to mention is the other incident that some people at least were very aware of were workers at Foxconn who, it wasn't a case of mass tragic, of tragic 
deaths with martyrs the same way, but it was a sense that zero COVID was locking people in infected areas. And so a policy that was supposed to be all about protecting lives was in fact endangering lives and workers, um, were, there were the worker protests before there were the, um, the protests after the fire that got so much more attention. And I think it's important not to leave that out of the narrative. Can I add that I think one of the things I have really learned from a lot of reporting in Russia and in China is never to underestimate the courage and the bravery of, of individuals. Um, I think some of these things are so surprising to us because we understand the risks that would be involved in taking to the streets, in shouting a political slogan in this context. And it's hard to imagine people would do that, but they do. You know, um, it, it's it's a very humbling thing to 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 see people take those those risks um now um and and you know and and in so many other places too at the same time but i i think the jeff is onto something in terms of identifying with the fire in this sense of that could have happened to me i think one of the things that i saw as a trajectory that people would would follow when i was based in china was this sense that there's one couple in particular who stick with me, the sense that you could, if you weren't in direct contact with some of the more repressive sides of the system, you could kind of live your own life regardless of it. You weren't forced to, to confront it. And I remember this older couple who I, I think it was in their 60s that, that they'd gotten into a, a property dispute, said until that point when they saw other people um, complaining about the system or criticizing the, the CCP, they assumed that they must have done something wrong. And it wasn't until this happened to them that they understood the injustice of it and how quickly that the system could work against them. So I, I think there is an argument to be made that the zero COVID policy as a whole and the mass lockdowns we're seeing could be people understanding that en masse, that you don't have to do anything wrong to then have to suffer very, very terrible consequences. Yeah, no, I uh, want to agree with, you know, what uh, Katie and Jeff have said. Um, basically, segmentation uh, and driving wedges between different segments of the population is a key method of uh, preventing and minimizing collective action in authoritarian regimes. Uh, what recent events have done is to dissolve some of some of these wedges. Uh, and that's that's actually quite alarming for the Chinese government, uh, especially overseas, right? So overseas, I mean, what the government has wanted, the grand unity of all the ethnic groups and people, you know, people of Hong Kong is finally happening, you know, uh, and, it, and it's extremely alarming for the Chinese government. So going forward, it would be interesting to see how the regime tries to rebuild these wedges to divide um the disaffected population both within china and overseas uh and also you know how uh the emerging especially overseas uh protest movement will try to mitigate against these wedges um so i think from a kind of a scholarly perspective this will be really interesting to see just to add something to these really thoughtful remarks um i, I assume perhaps like all of you um my WeChat feed, uh, which is, of course, primarily friends in China, lit up in ways I'd never seen before on three occasions. One was the death of Dr. Li Wenliang. The second was the Shanghai lockdown. And then the third was the Urumuchi fire. Um, and I have a sense that other people noticed this, too, that for the immediate aftermath of each of those events, um, one's WeChat feed, which is you know generally not as <laughs> politicized or as fraught was suddenly just lit up with a real sense of, of anger. And extrapolating from that, um, it does seem like those were really important events and at least the conception of people who are online like that. Um, and what I don't know is one, how much that permeated out, you know, China's got one point, four or five, I don't even know what it is now, billion people, how much of that is more widely shared? I, I genuinely don't know. I'm quite confident that the, you know, the elite group or the group that's online 
had th those reactions that we're talking about. I just really don't know how far out it per permeated. Um, and I do have a sense, at least anecdotally, that especially at the time of the Shanghai lockdown, that there were people in other cities who um, maybe didn't feel the same sense of solidarity and even thought, well, that's because they made mistakes in Shanghai. They weren't as careful as we were. And the, the second thing that I, I'm not sure about, I think there is a almost natural temptation um, to view some of the solidarity we're seeing on the streets right now with the victims of the Urumqi fire um, as sort of transcending that boundary of maybe uh, feeling more um, sympathy or uh, solidarity with the Uyghur population that has been persecuted so severely over the last few years, as we all famously know. I just, I'm not sure about that, you know, and I think it's one of those things that would be super interesting if it's true, but we it's very hard to know if it really does transcend that boundary or if it's just a more, at a very elemental level, people feeling like, yeah, when I'm locked in, I'm afraid that I something might happen to me too. And that's what's generating the anger. Just right, yeah. these are these are all such wonderful comments by all of you. I, each of them sets off something else in my mind. I mean, I do think it would be, it's important to note that within um, Xinjiang itself and, and within uh, Tibet, there have been some of the protests that are disproportionately Han taking to the streets because the severity of the response to um, to Uyghurs or Tibetans would be so much more severe. So we need to have that woven into uh, the discussion uh, as well. Katie's point about just these acts of just astonishing bravery is they have knock-on effects that are extraordinary. And um, they simply, they can inspire somebody in a totally different context to do something as well. I remember I talked to people who were part of the Eastern European dissident movements, and they talked about how inspiring the tank man was. And from a rational point of view, the tank man incident should have convinced you to not go on the streets because you saw, you know, or the protests, and they said the Tiananmen protests in general were so inspiring. But it was, in fact, this saying, like, how can we not take protests how can we not take risks when they're taking those risks? And a parallel of this flowing into China, um, in this case that I've heard, and this is partly anecdotal, but I think it makes sense. The World Cup was not just a place where people saw maskless spectators, but they also saw members of the Iranian team doing something incredibly daring, which was not singing uh, the mm -hmm. national anthem. A kind of silence thing, which again, you know, it's not that you see what your situation is identical, but you just say, look at that. Look at how gutsy that is in a high profile way. People who can all be named are doing that at this kind of moment. So what, and now just one final thing with Victor about dividing how author authoritarian states go to great lengths to divide different social groups from each other. So do non authoritarian states. And so do situ so situations that have nothing to do with this kind of protest. And cycling back to the strike, there are the strike is not just by TAs and graduate students, but also by postdocs and, um, and, and lab workers. And the administration has given in more to demands from the, to have, have given concessions to the postdocs and lab workers in an effort, in part, one would have to think, to break down some of that kind of solidarity across lines. That's great. Um, so yeah, so the, the, Jeff, your comments are a good lead into the next question where we can dive more squarely into the meaning of these protests. And so, uh, you know, the, there's tendency to generalize about what's going on with these protests. And if you're on Twitter, you're seeing a lot of hot battles over, you know, is this something minor or is this, you know, nothing to see here, or is this about, is this the beginning of a color revolution? And so there's lots of different um, aspects. There are surely lots of reasons that people are protesting. You know, some of it's about the lockdowns and, uh, you know, so, some people are calling for greater political reforms. There's been a lot of attention given to kind of protests related to censorship. 
Um, there have been, been some explicit calls, which is sort of shocking to hear for, for Xi Jinping to, to step down. Um, and so can can you guys walk us through kind of the range of positions and um, help us to understand the diversity of views here? And, and I think, you know, your comments that you just gave, Jeff, also are highlighting the fact that this is not at all static, right? This is something that people are coming out at one moment in time for one reason, and they're seeing what other people do. They're seeing how the government responds, all these types of things. And so so help us understand that. And, and based on your knowledge, you know, how do we think about how it's going to go going forward? So I guess one of the things is simply that it's easier for people to do things that they've done before. So, um, you know, crowds of people learn things about how to how to act uh, collectively. And, you know, there's they also learned about the risks um, things. It's it's been interesting to see there's been some discussion, um, maybe even it was one of one of you mentioning online that in some ways Jiang Zemin dying um, when he did and potential mourning ceremonies could be an opportunity for protest because somebody mourned, or it could be that it's that people are more aware of the risks right now because of the crackdown going on. That if he had died at a quieter moment, maybe something could have come out of nowhere. And there's so many individual choices made. It's very hard to to use this for any kind of predictive way. But I think it is just true that, that protesting is something that people that are used to doing, they then, they then know where to gather, they have some sense of how to do things. So I think a little bit about the fact that the 1986 um, protests in China that I happened to be in China for petered out pretty quickly but they helped lay the groundwork for the 1989 ones. And that doesn't mean that this is going to lay the groundwork for something else, but it reintroduced a generation to um, some of the strategies and tactics and used to, to, to working together. It's also, of course, a wake up. This is a wake up call for the, the authoritarian state that they need to ramp up their game potentially even more if they want to, to keep um, to keep from happening, uh, keep these things from happening. On the other hand, again, there are just all these variables involved. I think what we saw last weekend and then the dying down would have there it would have happened differently if one protester had been killed. You know that there are these things that happen that the state, I think, was balancing in part repression enough to scare, but not enough to provide. The martyrs, and I think Nason, you bringing up Dr. Dr. Lee, it's incredibly powerful reminder of um, the power of a certain kind of of martyrdom as a, a, a galvanizing uh, force. And there's been an effort. I, th I thought this was very true in the Hong Kong uh, protest that the um, that the authorities used incredibly tough tactics against the movement but also tried very hard to not have a clearly rallyable um, martyr or massacre, and also tried very hard to not have the kind of iconic photograph that would provide this kind of way of crystallizing what was going on. So they're sort of distributing uh, the repression. And it does seem to me that the repression here, in some ways, similarly, is trying to do things that um, will scare people but not provide that kind of um, new rallying point. But that's why we just, that's the, all these things are very, you know, it's, it's very, so it's so contingent. Um, but, the, and so if we were surprised by these protests happening, we should be prepared to be surprised by, by other things or to be surprised by things quieting down. We just don't know. If I could just build on, on that, you know, in, in a roundabout way, uh, come back to to Alex's question. What I find um, intellectually as a scholar very stimulating, um, but also very difficult, is that there are so many reference points that we naturally call on when we're looking at what's happening. And that's not to say that those reference points are not relevant but they are different reference points and they may not be relevant. And so it's really challenging to look at these scenes and 
which you know evoke obviously scenes from 1989, scenes from 1986, scenes from 1976. But then for those of us who have been looking very closely at sort of protest in China, we know that you know in the late 90s, 2000s, there were protests all over the place on all sorts of issues, land takings, environmental pollution, government taxation, um, and some of them incredibly violent. And I always used to think to myself, whatever we were seeing as outsiders was only a fraction of the reports that were going into Zhongnanhai, right? So there was always just all these crazy scenes that you could think, oh, there's way more than that. And so you see these scenes now, um, and of course, I should say Hong Kong as well. We have that, that's the most sort of, in some ways, recent reference point. It's very natural to say, oh, this is like one of those. And what we know about in retrospect of what those things ended up happening or what the dynamics were, projecting them onto this. And I think that's not a something not to do at all, because at some point, as you know, scholars, we have to have reference points, but at the same time, trying to keep our mind open in the way that Jeff is suggesting, that there may be something new happening here that doesn't fit into those boxes. You know, and maybe not, maybe it does fit into those boxes. You know, that I think intellectually is, is a real both challenge, but also a stimulation. Um, and I don't really know, and I am very mistrustful of anyone who says that they do know, right? If anyone says this is exactly like one of those things, I just can't imagine how one could know that. Um, but obviously, at some point, we'll know what the dynamics of this were, and then it'll be a little easier to fit it into some kind of analytical framework. I just want to add to that um, and a little bit open the aperture beyond China, which is this the sense that, that Jeff was touching on there of protests as, a, as an organic two-way process. So there's the actions of the individuals and the protesters who go out onto the streets or who share a message online, but then there's a response of the authorities. And what we saw happen in Ukraine back in the winter of 2013 to 2014 was those the initial protests in response to the Yanukovych's refusal to sign the EU association agreement were really quite small. You know, there were several hundred, perhaps, you know, several thousand people on the street at the height of it. But it was the police response to it. They, they were they were dying down. I remember we had decided we were, you know, they, they were probably going to be done by the next day. But overnight that night, when it was down to just tens of people in the square, that was when the riot police came in with real violence. And that was what brought out then the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands, and then, you know, the, the million person marches that we saw. So there, a lot of this is also contingent on the official response and whether that sustains and catalyzes further protest. Anyone else? Well, that was I uh, again. That that was the same story with Hong Kong. That you um, both the uh, you know I was <laughs> I was in I I went I was planning to be in Hong Kong for the June Fourth vigil in 2019. I was over there for that. I stayed for a few more days. I saw lawyers do a silent protest, and then I I went home, and nobody was saying, "God, you you're interested in this topic. You should stick around for a few more weeks." The biggest protest uh, in arguably in in the world in terms of the percentage of a city on the street is about to happen. And it was partly to do with with official responses. And it was partly to do with uh, the degree of pent up frustration or a sense of a last a last stand against this inexorable process that was going on for a long time. But this was true also in Hong Kong in in 2014, the use of tear gas by police in an unexpected way. Lots of people um, just sort of said, like, until then, it just stripped away a sense of the police as a benevolent force. I know Hong Kongers in the United States who said, I just got on a plane. They were using tear gas against our people. What's going on here? And so there are these 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 moments that um, we don't see coming. And I think with Mason's point, it's it's true. Don't trust any suggestion of a of a perfect analogy. And the question is sometimes, sometimes if you place a few side by side, it gets you closer, I think. Um, you know, so rather than look at the exact person that, you know, Jiang Zemin's death is like, we should think maybe it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. 
Um, the the person I keep thinking about who died, who Jiang Zemin reminds me of, isn't Hu Yao Bang or Zhou Enlai, but at the moment, it's another person who was born the same year as Jiang Zemin and died this year at the age of 96, uh, Queen Elizabeth II. In Hong Kong, her death became something that people were expressing uh, regret for, and some of them because they were nostalgic for a time in their life. Some had no nostalgia at all, and even like discussed with the colonial period, but thought, hey, this is an opportunity. Uh, we're allowed to do something in public. So let's go there and mourn her. But then they started singing Glory to Hong Kong, which is a song about how really you can interpret it as Hong Kong finally being freed of all forms of colonialism. And so some people are thinking about with Jiang Zemin, there's been a lot of chatter back and forth, like, wouldn't it be ironic if Jiang Zemin became a rallying person for anti-Xi sentiment and there were some kind of student protests because Jiang Zemin rode to power on suppressing part of a suppression of student protests. But that kind of irony can happen. You focus on one part of this with, with, um, uh, with Queen Elizabeth's death, just, you know, I, I've talked to uh, two different Hong Kongers who said two different things. One was like, I don't care how much of an opportunity it would be, we shouldn't use anything related to colonialism as an opportunity to protest. And another says, well, that they remember um, their parents have this strong image of Queen Elizabeth coming to Hong Kong and going to the night market, going and talking to ordinary people in a way that when Xi Jinping comes came to Hong Kong, he's separated out completely from everybody. He presides over a military parade. And, and all of these things can be can be true. And you can sort of read what you want to into um, a leader's career or death. And uh, going back to the protests of the early 2000s that Nason was good to remind us of, there were workers who carried uh, pictures of Mao quite a lot. And some people said, what do you mean? Does, do they want to go back to the Cultural Revolution? But for a lot of them, it was that Mao stood for Mao of the 1950s, who was saying workers should have these jobs for life. Mao, carrying a picture of Mao mainly meant anger at the current um, economic policies and being laid off from state factories and the people not talking about, um, about um, jobs for life or workers being in the world. I mean, you could think about this in many ways. Michael, you mentioned we've come a long way from Mao's days with um, with women. You know, if somebody said right now, you can quote Mao, you could say, he said, women hold up half the sky. It doesn't mean you aren't aware of all the stories about his actual behavior uh, with women. And, you know, it's it's seizing on a particular part of this complex uh, political life. And it doesn't mean that you're looking at, that you're unaware of or naive about these other sides of them. And I can't resist mentioning that um, the last student protest before the current one that I noticed um, and that I think maybe some people have forgotten a little bit because of all the drama that's happened since then. But in fall 2019, um, there were students, especially at Beijing University, who were Marxists. Right. And their whole thing was that um, China was not uh, as socialist as Marx um, had sort of laid out in his vision and that early Mao, as Jeff is saying, had had maybe expressed, um, obviously at a much smaller scale than what we are seeing now, but big enough to attract international media attention um, and to attract a very strong governmental response. You know, I actually was on campus at Beijing University um, when one of those protests happened. And I you know, was aware that there was this big commotion outside the East Gate and found out later that you know, the police presence that came in and took the students away was really quite, quite strong. Um, so which is just to say that uh, there's a lot of different things going on, especially when we think about student protests, a lot of different ideas going on. Um, and figuring out what is exactly kind of the core of it at any given moment is incredibly challenging. And since Michael mentioned um, women's role in the protest, there were Me Too protests and there were feminist, the Feminist Five. 
Um, so there have been, there have been things percolating under the surface and sometimes through the surface um, that, yeah, so these things don't come out of nowhere. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to pick up on this challenge that we're facing in terms of our positionality vis-a-vis -vis what's been playing out. I mean, personally, I haven't been back to China since November 2019, and I didn't do a poll, but I suspect all of you probably haven't been back uh, in this time range either. And there's also just in general, fewer international journalists, scholars, China watchers with boots on the ground in China than any time in recent memory. During this same period, media has become increasingly polarized, politicized. There's this real bifurcation in terms of the narrative within China, internationally, also internationally between the right and the left. And so what are our challenges that we face in terms of really understanding and misunderstanding what we're seeing? I mean, I feel like we're almost in a hall of mirrors. And so how do we navigate that? And even a very personal question, where do each of you go to be informed and to get the latest information on what's happening? And I don't think Victor has chimed in a while. Maybe we, if Victor is willing to jump in, maybe we can start with uh, Victor for this round. Well, no, I mean, this it sounds like it's Katie. Katie should take the lead on this issue. So you're you're right. I left China in 2018, um, and I have not been uh, I have not been based there since. I I would say it has become extraordinarily difficult for many of my colleagues to operate there. And I think the thing we often miss in talking about the difficulty of doing journalism in China, which I, I kind of touched on right at, at the start, is all of our Chinese colleagues. So, you know, the, the bylines that you see, or, you know, in, in my case, the, the Muppet standing in front of the camera it, it is me, and I have a foreign passport. And, you know, yes, there are, there are certainly there are terrible things that can happen to you, but that's nothing like the day-to-day, -day, you know, I, I would be working with, with Chinese colleagues on a, on a story, just, you know, something quite inane, and they would be being taken to one side and asked by um, security officials who suddenly um, popped up, you know, why they hated their country, and, you know, why, why they're helping um, tell lies about China, why, um, why they're doing propaganda for, for the US or the UK. So, it, you know, I, I, I'm always reluctant to focus too much on how difficult the conditions are for Western journalists um, when the conditions for our, our Chinese colleagues are, are just are just so much worse. I, I think the first thing in, in reporting and, on, and in covering China is being very clear about the limits of our access and how much can't know. And also, I think we, we have a kind of a continual imperative to put things in perspective and to be clear that yes you know this group of people was shouting slogans about Xi Jinping how representative of of the rest of the crowd was that were other people joining in were there people who said that actually once the slogans became political they became uncomfortable so I, I you know there we 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 always need to be asking those questions and I think foregrounding those questions um, in, in our coverage. And I, you know, I'm very fortunate that the kind of journalism that, that I'm now doing is much more, you know, let's look at the historical context for this. Let's call up Jeffrey Wasserstrom and ask him, um, you know, what, what does the scholarship tell us about this? So I, I think when you're working under such limitations and such difficulty of access, sometimes the more kind of helpful types of journalism, and I think the more informative types of journalism you can do is speaking to you know, the brilliant scholars who, who, are, who are part of this event and trying to understand what we can about, you know, where are the parallels here? What is the literature that we need to understand? Um, and, and yeah, being very clear about what, what the limits of what we do know is. Or are. Yeah, no, I mean, I'll add to that, you know, in academia, um, things have really, really changed as, as we all know. And I personally just miss having long and deep conversations with my Chinese colleagues, um, you know, both learning about their own personal, you know, views on various issues and also, uh, you know, sort of rumors <laughs> that, that they've heard about this and that kind of policy. Um, you have to remember that China is the second largest economy in the world. And 
really for people around the world to only have this kind of arm's length um, information or knowledge about China is, is really not good for China. Uh, because that will lead to misunderstanding. It will lead to misinterpretation of things that are happening. Um, fortunately, I think the leadership is aware of that. I mean, you do detect more recently this kind of more diplomatic uh, blitz. Um, and apparently Xi Jinping had a had a heart, heart to heart talk with the head of the EU just uh, last night where he revealed uh, some very interesting perspectives on the protests. You know, he didn't blame it on hostile foreign forces. He just said, you know, students uh, are very fed up. Um, and that that is a more of a realistic appreciation of, of the events. Um, but then hopefully more opening, uh, which seems like it could be happening uh, soon, although I think it will be ups and down. I mean, we can we can talk about the future in, in a little moment. Um, uh, you know, hopefully more of this opening relaxation of COVID policies will allow the resumption of more of this exchange, which is really vital for both China and for the rest of the world. I, I could not possibly agree more with everything that Katie and Victor have said, and I'm not going to add to that. Um, I have been very vocal on uh, the importance of um, exchange with Chinese scholars and how much we're missing by not being on the ground there. But what I want to add here goes back to the other component of Michael's question, which had to do with the current environment, um, especially here in the US, which I think adds another layer of difficulty to the problem. So it's not just that as China scholars and journalists, many of us are not able to be on the ground um, in the way that we were before and to have that kind of knowledge. But we are now in a context in the US where the discourse about China is frankly so toxic that um, any things that are sort of apparent from abroad are immediately put into the most damaging possible box. Um, and that's that makes it even harder. So I think, you know, in terms of um, even these protests now, I think a lot of the sort of popular discourse around it is jumping immediately to one of those reference points I mentioned earlier. This is the new June 4th. This is, you know, the new thing that's going to kind of like overwhelm China. Um, and it's very hard to kind of break through the noise of that kind of analysis. And it's not just at an intellectual level. I also think that has real ramifications on the ground um, for, you know, even people's safety. And, and what I'm thinking about here is, you know, there's the there's many student protests um, sort of that have emerged in the United States so that in the last few days in different college campuses, we had one here uh, at Penn um, that I'm aware of. And there was some uh, reporters who were there uh, sort of filming the students and putting their faces on camera. Um, there's another anecdote that I saw come up the other day on Twitter about how some Chinese students at the Yale Daily News wanted to write about the protest, but didn't want to put their names on the uh, article because of you know concerns about you know the situation in China obviously um, but the Yale Daily News editors uh, said that you only have the choice of either having the article not appear or have it appear under the byline of someone else and to me these are you know small incidents perhaps but they they reflect the broader problem that without um, you know specialized knowledge of China being more at the fore of our public discussion about these kinds of dramatic events. Um, there's a lot of room for misunderstandings and and mistakes that can actually have a real impact on on people's safety. I know Jeff, if you wanted to chime in, or well, I just, another so question. It's, it's it's the one. Uh, there are so many ironies of of the moment, but one irony during these protests was how important a source of information Twitter was, and how you can have the same. Thing that is terrible in many ways. Um, what, you know, I, I went on Twitter Spaces to hear Tung Biao and others in a Chinese language discussion of the protests that could not happen in in China. You know, and so at the same time that all kinds of the the same media that can be causing all kinds of terrible things to happen can also become an important um, uh, venue for spread of information. Um, and so forth. I mean, it is a real challenge to figure out how to try to get any sense of what's going on um, uh, 
one in China. And I think the now, I mean, for me, the strategy is eclectic, you know, to try to find as many different um, people to listen to as possible and to follow and to find out what they're talking about and people who have different kinds of networks and sets of people within um, within the Sinophone world in different ways. Um, and, um, you know, more ironies. I mean, one of the people I find incredibly insightful and I like to follow online is Ting Guo, who was one of the people who was going to be on this panel and felt that she couldn't be part of it because of, um, to show solidarity with, with the strikes. I mean, but these cross-cutting things, I think, are part of the world um, we're living in. And it's one of the challenges of the time. So I think trying to, uh, so yeah, just being kind of radically eclectic um, without being totally, you know, there are all kinds of terrible things about the current media environment. I will mention one thing I think is a positive thing. This new venture semaphore um, is just been started. I, I just paid attention to it because an editor at The Atlantic I worked with Prashant Rao is now involved with it. And the Atlantic was quite extraordinary in the way it covered the, kept paying attention to Hong Kong, even when Hong Kong was out of um, the headlines with um, Tim McLaughlin writing great stuff from there. There is some amazing um, journalism being done and I'm, I'm awed by people who can pull it off. Um, Chris Buckley just had a piece in the New York Times and he did, in, he did great reporting inside of China including um, with Wuhan, but here he is in Sydney and he was managing to bring in Chinese voices. He um, drew heavily on Mary Gallagher, who's a very good voice among scholars on this. I mean, I was quoted, but I was really just thrilled to be in the, cat, in the uh, company of Mary Gallagher and Jeremy Barmay, who I'll read anything he writes on China. His China heritage, which continually is translating voices from within, um, uh, Chinese, it's it's largely elite, uh, critical elite voices, but that's something that is easy to get lost um, as well. So there are pockets of things to feel kind of um, good about, even though I agree it's a it's a really dangerous and disturbing time in many ways in terms of the flow of information as well as in what's actually happening. And just to add one small point on Chris Buckley, because I think it it resonates more broadly. Chris Buckley does amazing reporting and amazing reporting from Sydney that's against the backdrop of decades of being on the ground in China. When you have had decades of being on the ground all throughout the country, it's a little bit easier to do the kind of work that he's doing now from Sydney. And what I'm mostly concerned about is not just those of us who have had that kind of experience, what we are seeing now, but the next generation of scholars and journalists who are at the moment not able to build up that kind of experience that, you know, if you don't have a change, you know, the coming years, I think going forward points to a real, real massive problem. Just very briefly, I do think it's just an extraordinary strategic mistake on the part of the Chinese government to have expelled all of these extraordinary journalists who are now relocating to Taipei. I saw the other day Chris Buckley is going to Taipei. Um, there will be brilliant nuanced coverage of Taiwan. Um, so it, 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 you know, there, there's this constant exhortation uh, from the CCP to tell story, tell stories of China. We we will miss that lens of having so many people based there. So I, you know, I I think that's a real own goal. And another another own goal in a sense was having the Peace Corps not be there or and now we're saying you take somebody like uh, Peter Hessler and not extend his time there. I mean, these are exactly the kinds of stories that um, you would think you would want to, to get out from there. I think it's important also to think about, but the, the radical eclecticism is also um, sometimes the Chinese state focuses on it, hierarchies that are carried over um, from Western hierarchies. So they go after the higher profile um, publications. I think the some of the most extraordinary, well, at the same time that the New York Times and Wall Street Journal reporters were, were, were kicked out, my the paper that I read each morning, the Los Angeles Times, Alice Sue was like under the radar for a little while and doing this amazing reporting. I mean, there are people now, um, Matthew Walsh from the from AFP is on the ground in Shanghai talking to people. And so even though I, you know, I praised Chris 
I thought you were going to say Chris Buckley also did graduate work in Chinese studies before um, before going into journalism. Well, we that 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 may help as well. But I think also just being ready to look at and you know sometimes there are reporters from other um, from other countries, other other languages. The more that we can get access to that of people who are somewhat under the radar for one reason or another, though there are fewer and fewer, it's important to um, amplify those voices. And it's also important to pay attention to the people who are outside of China, but have regular contact with family in China and bring it into their writings, um, as Yang Yang Cheng does most kind of notably in, in, in the US and um, so anyway. So there are places to look. We we can be very depressed about many many things, but in other ways, this is there are positive things about this moment. Even just the fact that the protests took place, the fact that we're talking about uh, protests in different parts of China, and that it gives us a reason if we if we do it to bring in those earlier protests that have been forgotten and papered over. That maybe people will pay attention to talking about because there are ones that are more legible internationally that draw attention. But before I hand things oh, yeah. back to yeah. Alex, yeah. I just wanted to put out a public plea to my fellow panelists. If there are platforms, websites, sources that you think will be useful for our audience to get good, solid, up to the date uh, information that shows the complexity of what's unfolding, I encourage you to use the chat to share that with our viewers. Thank you. China Digital Times, hands down, got, got to go to china digital times uh, i'll try to uh yeah, put it up here. all right so we're, we're getting close to the end of our time right we have about 15 minutes left um might be the right time to ask a little bit about thinking forward what, what do we think are uh, likely state responses to this um and so i'll ask this in a couple of different ways you know so so the, the core question is what, what do you think the state's going to do in response to this um, you know, you could imagine some sort of course correction on policy. You could imagine, on the other end, a harder crackdown, or you can imagine some sort of mixed response, some crackdown, some course correction. On the course correction front, you know, I, I want to relate this to a couple of the questions that are, uh, you know, for example, Zoe Xu is asking about, you know, how does China get out of zero COVID? You know, if they're going to do course correction, how do they do this exactly and she she raises an interesting point you know are there sort of you know economic or political forces on the ground who who benefit now from zero covid and might become barriers to getting rid of uh, zero uh, covid the the other um interesting question i want to bring in from the the uh, audience questions is this notion that um zero covid policy uh, you know, the people's concern that zero COVID policy is a Trojan horse to bring in kind of the heavy surveillance state, right? Like now people are much more surveilled. They're they're limited in their way to, you know, the, their ability to go different places. And so to what extent will that be a long-term consequence of, of this? And, you know, I, this is not the focus of that question, but, you know, one way to read it is also, you know, in the citizen response to all this, is there a risk of asking for too little, right? You get satisfied that you had some protests but then there are these long-term changes that may people may not want that that last and, and and end up getting fixed so so again the, the short question kind of what do you think are the state responses and and we can probably throw in uh citizen responses as well but and and also how do we how do we get out of the zero code policy i can give it an initial crack so i think um you're right to bifurcate the two sets of issues on the COVID response in particular, um, I think it is pretty much well recognized at this point that the government is sending signals about, and by the government, I mean the central government in particular, about wanting to modify the policy. And the signals it's sending include um, some notion of finally uh, vaccinating the population, the elderly population that's not vaccinated. Um, but they have a lot to do. Uh, and it's not the kind of thing that they can just turn it on or off. 
not only the vaccination, which would take some time, and it's not clear that it's going to be mandatory. I mean, there may be a new kind of support for the notion of vaccination, but it's still not mandatory. In any case, it will take some time. But even if you have the vaccination part of it, you probably do still need to build up hospital capacity as well if you really are going to start to open up, um, because there will be greater cases and greater incidence of severe illness and greater incidence of death. And so you need to have that capacity built up as well. And that's not something you can do overnight as well. It does seem to be um, uh, maybe the small signals we're seeing just in the last few days, including the comments that Xi Jinping made um, that Victor uh, just referenced that was reported on the South China Morning Post and is meeting with the EU official are kind of indicating, you know, some sense of that. And even, you know, we're seeing in the local level, um, you know, some messaging from local governments um, and some maybe uh, very haphazard policy changes, like I just read in Beijing. Uh, now, for the first time, you won't have to uh, have a test within 48 hours to, to get on the Beijing metro. Um, so all of this is just to say there does seem to be some adjustability being signaled by both the central government and the local governments, but you know that's not enough to say that the policy is really going to adjust um, in the time frame that will be most satisfying to the protesters we're seeing, um, or that it even could be adjusted in that time frame. So that's there's a lot of uncertainty on that point. What I am a little bit more certain about unfortunately, is the second part of your question, which is the response to the protesters. Um, I very much fear that that is going to be as thoroughgoing and, frankly, as brutal a response as we saw vis-a-vis -vis the protest movement in Hong Kong. I think, to me, that is, at least I was saying that all these reference points are, you know, we have to be careful about them, but the reference point that I think about is not the tanks in Tiananmen Square, but I think about how effective and in some ways quiet under the surface, but in reality, quite brutal the response was to the protest movement in Hong Kong. That's what I think is likely to happen vis-a-vis -vis the protesters, even if the overall message of you need to adjust the policy does sort of filter through in a way that does start to make the policy adjust. Uh, no, I, I completely agree with you in terms of the repression uh, and crackdown. And also, you know, I think, Michael, you also asked about the electronic surveillance. Uh, so even if we do see some degree of relaxation, I think the government will still insist that people uh, still have the the app to, to track COVID uh, to be on their phones. Uh, because, of course, uh, contact tracing can be reimposed uh, and also mandatory either in-home. Well, so first of all, I think mandatory in-home quarantine will persist i mean is here to stay for for quite uh some more time there is a rumor that it, there's no longer this kind of off-site quarantine um in some places at least um so we'll see if that transpires um but if um there's still contact tracing then the government's ability to track the movement of people on a very massive scale will continue um yeah, so I, I don't think people can uninstall, you know, this this uh, software from their phones for some time to come. This next uh, audience question kind of picks up on that theme. This is from Dr. Paul Krieger, and he asks, how important is social media to both the protesters and the Chinese government? How are protesters able to circumvent the government's blocking of social media, including the circumvention of video? How is Where are we in the war of... Who is winning the war of social media in China between the government and uh, protesters, net netizens? What's it's been a continual cat and mouse game with all kinds of creativity that we've seen uh, employed online. But where are we now, and where does it seem like things are going in terms of social media in China? Anybody want to comment on that? It's both. I mean, you know, this is the thing. It's it's always the the story of of new media is largely about that. It's the back and forth. It's that. Um, I mean, there is a very powerful. Uh, there's very thought provoking book to think about. It has nothing to do with China, but it it's good to think about with China called The Quiet Before by a guy named Gal Beckerman, who's now um, books editor at The Atlantic. 
And it's about the way the intersection between the development of new ideas and social movements and different kinds of uh, media of communication. And his argument is that um, social media, to boil it down, is, is very good at getting to dramatic moments, getting people out on the streets and much less effective at a kind of buildup of new ways of um, new ways of thinking and kind of more enduring things that it can get it can it can jump you to what he calls the third act of protest quickly uh, of a drama. And I think it's I think it's partly convincing. It's a good way to think about some of what's going on and how things can flare up incredibly big and then die out. But I think actually in the Chinese case and certainly in the Hong Kong one, I think probably in other cases too, it underplays the way in which actually the online activities can sometimes be um, a thing that provides you with the kinds of exchanges that then matter when you do get on the streets. And I think things like the eruption with Dr. Lee, Lee's death preceding, even though it was all online, providing people with some kind of templates for their anger. Now, I think the other thing it underplays is the importance of global circulation and movement between different places. So I think the, the sort of upside of the social media story at the moment is how things can spread from very different parts of the world in ways that it took longer to um, in the past. So that you have, um, you know, it both increases the, the tools of the state, but it also includes, it increases the tools of those resisting it. So it's both at once, I think. I don't think we can say where it is in the total state of play. Thank you. There's actually an audience comment on this. Uh, that there is a new slogan that has emerged online, that to forward a message is activism. And so I'll just add, that's from an audience member. Uh, Katie, or anyone else want to comment on this? Just on that, I, I think we are seeing, I, I saw this week um, uh, indications that also I, I commenting and I think and forwarding, forwarding a message is also being treated as activism by the authorities. Um, so, I, you know, it, 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 it's, I think you see both sides learning and a, a very fast evolution of, of, of tactics. But I think what, you know, what, what really sticks with me looking at the developments from the Sitong Bridge protest to these in-person protests is how we have underestimated sometimes, um, particularly this, the, with the Sitong Bridge incident, how far those slogans had permeated and you know how we saw them then um, re reappear in you know in real life the, these this this past weekend. I was just sneakily trying to look up <laughs> on the on the screen to to check. I was getting the name of the paper that I wanted to recommend. Um, right, but which was um, now out of never by Timur Kuran, um, looking at the the spread of protests across Eastern Eastern Europe in the late 1980s. I think something that we can do when we understand how little. You know, I, I think often predicting predicting the future, especially as a journalist, where you have to write it down and put your name under it, um, is a is a fool's errand. But but looking back and trying to understand um, what what we can learn um, from from the past and from and from um, previous scholarship, um, I, I think I think can help to to inform us. And just final point on this, which is also I think it's important not to overcorrect in the other direction. Um, this past week, um, talking to, to editors in London about this, um, I, I kept finding um, pieces would, would come back with, with headlines on them, like, um, I, I don't want to embarrass it, individuals concerned, but is, is Xi Jinping losing his grip on power? Or is it game over for Xi Jinping? And, you know, because there is an element of surprise to what is happening now, I don't think we should overlearn that lesson and then move straight to China, the the imminent collapse of of the of the of the CCP. No offense to the very brilliant people who came up with those suggestions. <laughs> Thank you. So I see we're reaching the end of our allotted time, and I'm wondering maybe if we could wrap up by going around the room and each of you sharing what are the greatest lessons that we can take away from what's been unfolding in China over the last week, either for you personally as a journalist, as a scholar, or for the citizens of China. Well, what, what is your 
personal takeaway in your response to what's what's been happening. I was wondering if that's something maybe you'd be willing to share with us and our viewers and, and a way for us to kind of end with a moment of reflection. So one one thing I just wanted to say is that I was reading through the questions that have come in from the audience and it's not ignoring them, but a lot of them were asking things that then organically came up uh, through this. Although one of the things that was mentioned by one that I think is useful is that actually Xi Jinping's more kind of measured response to things that was apparent, apparently is blocked on WeChat. And they were saying this is the irony that often actually the stories, um, I think that sometimes this notion of the, the regime shooting itself in the foot by sometimes blocking actually the stories that would, would help um, provide a more nuanced uh, variety here. So I think, you know, reinforcing, it's the, what's been happening is reinforcing certain lessons that I sort of have to keep learning because I keep forgetting them. And one is just how fundamentally impossible prediction is because of so many moving parts and also the lack of information. But I think even people on the ground are, are really surprised, people with a lot of experience and long-term, that, that there is just something fundamentally surprising. 1989 was fundamentally surprising, not that there was a massacre, but that it took so long that people stayed on the streets and were allowed. Another thing going back to that is it's relearning the idea that writing off any generation of young Chinese as brainwashed or apathetic or just not interested in this is something that we keep learning the foolishness of. That when I got to Shanghai in 86, people said, oh, you study student protests. Nothing like that's going to happen now. This generation is all self-involved. And you kind of hear that over and over again. And you hear it about places within China. You hear it about, you used to hear it about Hong Kong, that Hong Kong wasn't a place where people really cared uh, deeply about things other than, uh, you know, making money and having a good time. It's like we keep relearning how... Um, how mistaken those kinds of things are and relearning. And I think Katie's point about this, we keep relearning that people just sometimes do extraordinarily uh, courageous things. And it's, it's quite staggering. And I think one of the takeaways, the biggest takeaway though also is how much the story of events in China, even at a time when China seems closed off is about, we have to keep mindful of international influences, international flows, both through people's conversations inside and outside of China, but also an awareness and an interest in other parts of the world and the way that stories that um, the government might not particularly censor because they don't see it as having a galvanizing effect could. I'm not sure that the government thought, hey, Iranian soccer players not singing the national anthem is a really dangerous thing for us, or even you know, the stories about what Victor was saying, his students are talking about going shopping. Oh, why should we care about censoring that? But that can have an influence as it comes in. So those are some lessons to relearn. Yeah, I, I think my, you know, the, the, the great joy and privilege of being a journalist is getting the chance to go to a lot of places in, in real life and speak to real people. And witness how people act in these circumstances and and you, you know i think the one overwhelming lesson is don't count out individuals um you know i think we're also seeing this i was based in, in russia before i was based in china and I, I covered a lot of the early part of the war in ukraine you know ahead of the russian invasion people thought that U ukraine was going to be steamrollered that zelensky would abandon kiev the whole war would be over in, in less than a week and people wouldn't fight to defend their country and yet they are. Um, so I, I, you know, I think that's the lesson that that we need to to keep learning is just don't count out the possibility of tremendous courage from individual people. What Jeff said was exactly what I had in mind. So I don't know that I have so much to add to it, but I just want to underscore the um i think one of the main themes of his comment which is how endlessly fascinating um china is modern china and the current situation um how much we have to do our best to uh, read the scholarship read the journalism talk to our contacts keep an open mind because it is not a context which lends itself to fast easy conclusions and i think not just this week, but this fat last few months, um, there's been so much that has surprised me. I was surprised by the uh, full 
you know, Xi Jinping group that came out on stage at the end of the 20th Party Congress. And I'm surprised by these students in these different cities. And those run in both directions. And so you have to keep in mind there are multiple narratives. It's a very dynamic picture. They're all happening, you know, around the same time. And uh, to say that any one narrative is the main narrative at any given moment is a fool's errand because we just don't know. And the students, you know, even if, if I, you know, suggested maybe pessimistically that there's going to be a pretty thoroughgoing crackdown at the same time, you know, the students are demonstrating all the things that Jeff said. They're demonstrating that even in this very difficult last few years, um, there is still the seeds of this kind of activism. And the performance that they're uh, engaged in now is sure to have its own effect going forward. And so there's nothing to say conclusively at this point. The, the story is still to be written. Yeah, I mean, to me, I basically echoing what Jeff is saying, um, you know, I think one thing that people have to realize is that uh, political science research uh, on Chinese politics has spent basically the past decade arguing that uh, there's authoritarian resilience, that, you know, China has built up all this uh, amazing capacity in controlling information flows, building up repressive forces, such that <clears throat> something like a multi-city political protest was just impossible. Uh, and we had all come to believe that, um, myself included, of course, um, and it's it's just not true. I mean, we, we now have to go back to the drawing board and really do research on, you know, how this was possible. Uh, and also, so I think the problem with the literature in political science is that there was too much of a focus on uh, two outcomes, you know, oh, status quo, or regime collapse. In fact, there is a whole range sort of in between those two things. And, and we're seeing in other countries also like Iran, right? So Iran, um, the regime still in power, of course, same thing in Russia, but it has transitioned from this kind of settled politics where there was very little public demonstration against the regime to a kind of an unsettled politics where now uh, demonstrations on the streets are pretty regular, you know, on the streets. And um, one interesting thing about China is whether it is making this transition from, you know, very settled politics of people not publicly voicing any disagreement with the regime, certainly not making uh, political demands, you know, systemic transformation of Chinese political system. We are seeing that across many different cities in China, um, so it'd be interesting to see whether, it, you know, China would transition into this, uh, still the Chinese Communist Party being in charge, being in power, no question about that, but a more unsettled kind of politics, and how will political science kind of explain this transition? Those are great comments. Um, you know, one fi final thing I, I might add is, you know, a source of information for me about what's been going on in China and uh, it has been the, the Chinese students that have been uh, at our universities, and many of us are in academia. And, uh, you know, the Chinese students came back to the law school this year after a brief uh, hiatus. And I have found that these students are also more, um, a lot of them have been really interested in, in discussing the law, the law and governance issues in, in China. And they've also been, you know, political actors of a sort, uh, even as they're not within China, you know, so I think we have to you know, people have alluded to the transnational and international aspects. And so that's really important for just spreading uh, information about what's going on, sharing information, thinking about, uh, you know, how to how to make China a, a better place uh, going forward. And so I uh, just wanted to highlight that. I know, to, you know, a number of my students had joined on, you know, even one of my students who has a tort final in, which is starting seven minutes ago, he was here for the first hour of our panel. So that gives you a sense of how interested he was in the topic. And so, um, so you know, I, I hope that uh, those of you online who will communicate with us more, it's really important uh, for exchange and for just uh, learning about what's going on. So with that, I want to thank Alex, my co-moderator, for joining me today and all of our wonderful speakers. Uh, we're so thankful that you took time out of your busy schedule to share your thoughts and reflections. I also want to thank the speakers that couldn't make it because they contributed to the kind of intellectual formation of the panel during the early stages. And we also support them in terms of the, you know, their take on navigating the complexities of the ongoing strike. And lastly, uh, not only our audience, but also to those, again, 
four of us in this room are UC professors. And I think I, if I could speak for all of us of how much we appreciate the labor that our graduate students perform for the university and how eager we are to see a happy resolution to, to uh, what's been happening. And we do stand in solidarity with our student uh, workers. And so with that, uh, thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you in future Center for Chinese Studies events. And take care, everyone. Stay safe. Wonderful. Take care, everyone. Thanks.